It's interesting to note that in every age and every time on earth, we have been faced with challenges that are apocalyptic in nature. World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, the Cold War, Korean War, Vietnam War, the pollution challenge during the 60s and 70s. Then we went back into the Cold War again, then it shifted to the Middle East with the first and the second Gulf Wars, Al Qaeda, the rise of terrorism, 9-11. Every age, people are faced with challenges like this. Now we're faced with COVID, climate change, and right-wing attacks on our democracy. Each and every age of believers has faced similar challenges. This is why the book of Revelation is so relevant for each and every age. In this video, I'm continuing our exploration of Revelation. What I want to do in these videos is give you some tracks to run on to help you read Revelation. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible and my name is David Paris and I've been teaching at seminaries for longer than I care to admit. The goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in the classroom and bring it to anyone anywhere on YouTube. So if you like these videos, please take a moment of your time and do me a favor. Subscribe to the channel, give the videos that you like a thumbs up and hit the share button to let other people know about these videos as well. These little actions will really help me spread the word about this channel on YouTube. The English title of this book, Revelation, creates problems for readers in the English language from the very start. The book opens with the words, the revelation of Jesus, but it should really be translated as the apocalypse of Jesus to his servant John. However, the Greek word apocalypse would have given the original readers a heads up about what type of literature or text they are going to read or have read to them. This type of signaling lets the reader know what to expect as they read this book. So for example, if a story opens with the words, once upon a time, you should immediately recognize that this is a fairy tale and therefore have a great idea of what to expect in the story. You know what type of characters to expect prince and princess, an evil stepmother, maybe a witch, dwarves, castles, so on. The same with apocalyptic text. In an apocalyptic text, the early readers would have expected to have a narrator who has visions. They go on a heavenly journey. They have an angelic guide who interprets or explains what they are seeing or taking place before them. There is going to be cosmic battles between the forces of good and evil often involving angelic beings. And one element that I forgot to mention last week is oftentimes the narrator takes a journey either going up or climbing a ladder into the heavenly realms. Revelation chapter four verses one through four really helps us to see all these features of an apocalyptic text. Chapter four begins with, after this I looked and there in heaven a door stood open and the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there in heaven stood a throne, with one seated on the throne. And the one seated there looks like jasper and carnelian. And around the throne is a rainbow that looks like an emerald. Above the throne are twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones are twenty-four elders, dressed in white robes, with golden crowns on their head. John's vision in chapter 4 opens with this vision of a door in heaven. It's above him and a voice calls out, come up here. In other apocalyptic texts, there's often a ladder that the narrator climbs. As I mentioned in the last video, we see this vertical axis. John is now above in the heavenlies and now no longer below on earth. And his vision in the heavenly realm in this chapter conveys two big ideas. 
The first is that God is worshipped above by those who have gone before us and heavenly beings. If we continue on in 4.8, it reads, And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all round and inside. Day and night, without ceasing, they sing, Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The second message is that God is the one who created all things and still rules over creation, no matter how bad things might seem from our perspective. Verse 9. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before the one who is seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. In many instances, apocalyptic literature was a response to periods of extreme hardship arising, for example, when foreign invaders would overthrow and occupy your land. Daniel in the Hebrew Bible is an excellent example of this. As a genre, apocalyptic literature was a means to provide an oppressed people with hope by projecting a future in which order would be restored to your nation by divine intervention. Now, at this point, I need to confess to you that I lied. Well, sort of. Revelation is an apocalyptic text, but it's far more complex than just an apocalyptic text. It's not your average, everyday, run-of-the-mill, apocalyptic type text. It has some prophetic and other characteristics as well. For example, in Revelation 1-3, it says that the person who reads the word of the prophecy out loud are blessed. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and keep what is written in it, for the time is near. The reference to the person who is blessed when they read it out loud is probably a reference to the person who is carrying this book from John and reading it out to the seven different churches that he addresses within this book. He's John's letter carrier and representative. This is then paired with a blessing on those who hear and keep what is written in it. Now this parallels Jesus' words in Luke 11:28. Jesus said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So you see how the book of Revelation parallels or fits with the teachings within the Gospels. This blessing is bookended in Revelation 22:7. In that verse it says, and behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. It's interesting that aside from the introduction and then chapter 22, there's very, very little attention given to the prophetic nature of this book. There's just a few references besides these within the text. And if you read through the book of Revelation, you'll find that it contains very, very few prophetic features. While prophetic and apocalyptic literature share certain features, for example, concerned with God's plans for the future, there are significant differences between the two genres. Prophetic literature tends to portray God as accomplishing his plans in human history through human agents. Apocalyptic literature, by contrast, tends to portray God as accomplishing his plans in human history through direct, divine, supernatural intervention, often in very, very dramatic ways. This is really seen in Revelation 19. In Revelation 19, the armies of heaven are summoned for the final battle with the forces of evil. And you think, ah, finally, the people of God are going to do something and cooperate in God bringing about his plans besides running away and being martyred by the thousands within this book. But then Jesus shows up on the scene, riding on a white horse, with a sword coming out of his mouth. And the next thing we know, the beast is captured, his forces are slaughtered, and the rider on the horse with the sword coming out of his mouth did it all. The saints really don't engage in the battle at all. Rather, God does it. If it were a prophecy, we would really expect the saints to be summoned to battle, to actually go out and do battle themselves. Now, if you were a first century Christian facing possible persecution from the Roman authorities, 
How do you think you would have understood this vision in chapter 19? I think it would have had a very, very powerful impact in your life. Yeah, the Roman Empire may not be the best environment to be a Christian within, and things might be getting really difficult. The emperor might be incredibly powerful, but look at the Lord we worship. He rides out to battle and decimates the forces of evil just with his word. So we can trust in him to help us here and now and also give us courage to stand firm. But wait, that's not all. Besides being prophetic and apocalyptic, it also has features and stylistic elements of a letter. It opens with a typical greeting of a letter in chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, the prescript, and it closes with a standard benediction in 2221. It also contains the seven letters to the seven churches. While this book was originally written to the seven churches that John addresses, it also includes exhortations and a message of hope to other congregations as well, from the time of the New Testament all the way down to us today. So let's spend a minute or two on those seven letters in chapters two and three. These are perhaps the most prophetic portions of the entire book. Each one of the letters to the seven churches contains some revelation about the nature or the situation of that church and also a call to action. For example, in the letter to the church at Ephesus, it opens in 2-1 with, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you have found them to be false. And then right before it closes, it has a call to action in verse 2-5. Remember then from what you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But just like the apocalyptic nature of the text, I lied to you again. These are not really letters. If you go back and you watch my videos on how to write a New Testament letter, you'll notice that these seven letters contain very, very few elements that a Greco-Roman letter would contain. So what are they then? Well, you're going to have to come back in a future video to find out because I don't have the time to address that right now. But they are really cool. And finally, into this whole mix, John adds a liberal dose of music. There are 13 hymns in the book of Revelation, and I've got a chart here laid out to show you. They span from the very, very first chapters all the way up to chapter 19. So you can see that however you read this book, you also need to understand it as sort of a psalm or a book that contains all these psalms or hymns within it. So let's take a moment and look at the one in chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slaughtered, and by your blood you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and people and nation and you have made them to be a kingdom and priest serving our god and they will reign on earth this hymn then forms the basis for van eck's central piece in his altarpiece at ghent you see the lamb upon the altar and then people coming from the four different corners north east west and south to worship the lord in heaven it's a beautiful piece of work, and it's one example of how this book has inspired art and architecture within the church down through the ages. Now, this hymn should serve as a reminder to the American church that has grown very xenophobic in recent years that the nature of the church then, now, and in the future is incredibly diverse and inclusive. And if you don't like that idea, you might want to go shopping around for a different religion. Now, one of the things we know about the early church is that they were definitely a singing church. And the hymns recorded in the book of Revelation were most likely hymns and songs that John's church knew and sang in their worship services. 
Incorporating these hymns within the book of Revelation does two things. First, it creates a shared space between John and those he's writing to. As the book was read aloud in their churches, they would have recognized these hymns and it would have involved them in the reading of it. Second, by placing these hymns in the mouths of those in heaven, it creates a shared space or bond between his readers and the heavenly realms. Not only do we sing these hymns here in our churches, but they are being sung in heaven as well. Remember, one of the primary purposes of an apocalypse is to give hope to its readers. It does this by showing that the situation on earth is a reflection of what's happening in heaven. By including these hymns, the bond between the reader's experience and John's vision of the heavenly realm is strengthened. The early church wrestled with whether to include Revelation in the canon of works for the New Testament. But the literary beauty and the creativity of the book of Revelation meant that it was widely read, quoted, and taught in the early churches. It truly is a masterpiece of literature. At the same time, the literary complexity of the book of Revelation should keep us on our toes as we read it from start to finish. It frequently shifts from one form of literature to another and then back again. It requires literary competency at least in at least four different genres apocalyptic literature, prophetic literature, epistles, and then also hymns or poetry. The complexity of this book is one of the reasons why it's so confusing and difficult for readers to understand. But at the same time, the beauty of its images and its very, very strong message of hope that there is a God above and he is going to intervene and bring about his plans within history is incredibly strong and relevant for every age of the church. In the next video, I want to dive into the different ways that Revelation has been read or interpreted down through the ages and give you a few guidelines for your own exploration of this wild and wonderful book. Till then, you know what to do. Subscribe, smash that thumbs up button, or as a student of mine said, thumb up it, and then hit the share button and send a link to this video to your friends and family. Till then, peace. Thank you.